For module 5, part B, we will now go over techniques for peripheral infusion therapy. There are three stages, precannulation, cannulation, and postcannulation. During precannulation, we check the physician's orders, do hand hygiene, gather and prepare equipment, prepare the client, and verify identity. We will also need to uh, choose the appropriate site and select the appropriate size needle, and we may have to do some vein dilation to make the cannulation easier. In regards to the physician's order, we need to expedite the process as quickly as possible. We're going to look at several things, including the components of the physician's order, which are the date and time of the order, the infusate name, such as normal saline or lactated ringers, the route of administration, dosage of administration, volume to be infused, rate of, of infusion, duration of effusion, and ensuring that the physician's signature is on the order. Other procedures um, may be scheduled, so we'll need to work around that or ensure that an IV is in place um, for those procedures as needed. Um, before we can start an IV, we have to have the um, physician's order in place. Furthermore, um, think about um, where we are putting IVs in someone that's had a mastectomy or an axillary node removal. And we will have to calculate any dosages as needed. In this slide, there is a sample orders. And one of the things that you need to consider is if there is a component missing from the physician's order. So at that time, you would need to clarify the order with the physician. Remember to do hand hygiene um, according to the CDC recommendations. We always practice universal precautions using soap and water or um, chlorhexidine depending on policies, um, a 15 to 20 second scrub, and also after touching and after removing gloves that we need to do hand hygiene. It's important to have appropriate equipment preparation. We will determine the infusate. First of all, um, within your scope of practice, are you allowed to administer that particular IV fluid or infusate? We're going to look at the color clarity, expiration date, and integrity of the container of the infusate. We want to make sure that we're meeting quality standards there. And also quality standards with the administration set or the saline lock. So we're going to look at the integrity of those pieces of equipment as well. There are two types of administration sets. There's what's called the micro drip. This is fluid to, um, for fluid to be given over a long time or if a small amount is to be given. Um, the other type is a macro drip. And that is when a large amount of fluid um, needs to be given over a short period of time. Or if um, counting the micro drips per minute, there are too many to do that easily, you would choose a macro drip. And likewise, you would choose a micro drip if the macro drips per minute are too few. In continuing to prepare the equipment, you'll need to prime the primary tubing. This is an aseptic technique, so we want to make sure that we're not touching any parts of the tubing or the container um, where entry is at risk. Um, for the saline lock, you're going to want to avoid touching the hubs um, to ensure that there is no contamination there as well. For the administration set, you will want to close your clamps first. And you may be asking why you need to ensure that your clamps are closed. Because as you prime, that fluid's going to go through the tubing and you will leak fluid everywhere if you do not have your um, clamps closed. You want to very carefully spike the bag so that you do not contaminate it. Again, paying special attention to the ports and um, the, um, the hubs where the piercings will be when you do spike the bag with the spike. Prime the tubing. You want to tap all the injection sites so that you can clear any air bubbles. Make sure the clamps are closed. Replace the cap and partially fill the drip chamber by squeezing it gently um, so that you can um, ensure that there's 
so no air in that drip chamber. Always identify your patient with two identifiers. Make sure that we maintain privacy and good hand hygiene as we discussed earlier. When we are educating our patient about the IV insertion, we want to explain the procedure, the purpose of it, the type of fluid and why, any mobility limitations, and um, discuss with them potential signs and symptoms of complications that we might encounter and what they need to notify us if they um, notice anything going on with the IV site. Additionally, um, we'll encounter um, some fears about IV insertion, so we have to psychologically prepare our patients for that. We want to be upfront and honest with them about the procedure and the potential pain that it may um, cause um, as we start those IVs. We also want to make sure that the patient um, has the appropriate family and visitors in the room with them, or if they prefer to have nobody in the room that we ask those um, persons to leave. Additionally, we need to make sure that we physically prepare the patient prior to the IV start, and that includes making sure they've gone to the bathroom. Um, sometimes it takes a little while to get these IVs in and get the fluid going and things like that, so we want to make sure that they've um, had an opportunity to get up and go to the bathroom. Um, we want to make sure that they're in a good position, and we also want to make sure that the clothing is appropriate, that they're wearing, um, especially if we're going to have to change clothing and things like that. We want to um, have as minimal complications with that as possible, so making sure that the snaps of the gowns are appropriate so that we can run the tubing um, appropriately through it, you know, um, if we need to, having women take their bras off, it's very difficult to um, take bras off once we start those IVs and get them hooked up to the fluids just because of the way that everything kind of links up. The other thing to think about is hair and the potential for contamination with that. One is the hair on the patient's body where you will be starting the IV, generally in the arm area, and your own hair and making sure that's out of your face while you are starting the IV. Another important step in preparation is preparing your tape, and that really needs to be done prior to distending the vein so that you can ensure you have everything ready um, to go when you um, are about to cannulate the vein. We also want to make sure that we've screened ahead of time so we know what allergies they have, any other medical conditions that could affect um, their IV placement. Does the patient have a history of breast cancer or renal failure? Have they had a history of cellulitis, burns, or edema? And we don't want to start an IV distal to those areas. What about paralysis or poor circulation? We want to also avoid those extremities. Um, avoid sites that are um, compromised. Um, we want to make sure that sites distal to previous venipuncture sites might be an, in an issue. Anacubital fossa vein, you know, that in a cube, um, we're bending those elbows. It can get really irritating um, starting IVs there. And the same with the inner wrist. Um, we have to bend our wrist, so it can be really um, irritating to have an IV started on that inner wrist. Any sclerosed or hardened cord-like veins, avoid those. Any sites of infiltration, phlebitic or bruised areas, areas of venous bifurcation because of valvular issues. Um, fragile dorsal veins in older adults, and vessels and extremities with compromised circulation. Again, dialysis grafts, paralysis, and mastectomy patients. We want to avoid those areas. Um, do they have any prior shunts or vac vascular access devices? Um, consider you know, their autonomy and hand dominance. Um, for my own personal preference, you know, I would I always start IVs if I can in the non-dominant side. Um, you know, so if someone's right-handed, I would start it in the left on the left side. And if they're left-handed, I would start it on the, the right extremity. Um, think about how long their treatment's gonna be, the anticipated length of treatment, the types of fluids and meds that they're gonna be having, and any upcoming procedures, the potential for surgery, blood, or a CT scan, so that you have the appropriate equipment in place. This slide is just giving some visual depictions of um, 
why you want to avoid certain areas. The top left picture is a patient who um, has had, um, it looks like potentially a mastectomy or lymph node removal and now has lymphedema. So we definitely want to avoid that extremity. Um, there's the picture below, it shows what a modified radical mastectomy would look like. And the reason lymphedema occurs is because those lymph nodes are removed. So we don't have the drainage in that extremity, um, that we would have if the lymph nodes were still there. So we want to be careful in those areas. Um, the top right is a picture of a shunt. So we want to avoid those areas as well in terms of starting IVs. Now that we have all of our equipment gathered and we have the patient educated, appropriately positioned, they've gone to the bathroom, we want to select our vein and um, descend the vein temporarily with the tourniquet at the appropriate distance. There's varying um, in, in bouts of information in terms of where to place that tourniquet. Um, some say four to six, six inches above, some say six to eight inches above. Um, so anywhere from four to four to five inches, four to six inches is probably a good rule of thumb in the video. Um, you might see it just one to two inches above the site. Um, but that does take practice and skill and you'll learn what um, works best for you. And it may not be the same on all of your patients. Um, keep in mind that um, after you've temporarily put the tourniquet at the appropriate distance, you want to release that tourniquet while you're preparing the site. Um, the INS standard says that vein selection shall include assessment of the patient's condition, age, and diagnosis, the vein condition, size, and location, and type and duration of therapy. The vein shall accommodate the gauge and length of the cannula required by the prescribed therapy. Keep in mind... If the first attempt fails with cannulation, you will go up and not down. Also, um, if there's too much hair in the site that you need to use, we're not going to shave that site. We're actually going to use clippers. Once we've determined which vein we're going to use, we will need to dilate our vein. And of course, we can use our tourniquet. Again, we don't want to... Um, keep the tourniquet on for too long. Um, we can use gravity, fist clenching, tapping. Be careful not to tap too hard um, and don't tap if the patient will be receiving chemo or anticoagulants. You don't want to aggravate that um, vein or injure that vein um, unnecessarily when we're getting um, meds like chemo and anticoagulants. Um, you can use a warm compress. Remember with a warm compress that you'll have to have a little bit of time um, to allow that to work. And the idea behind that is that warmth will dilate that vein um, so that it's easier to access. You can also use a blood pressure cuff, which works very similarly as the tourniquet. Sometimes you'll use a multitude of these methods um, all at the same time. Again, with a tourniquet, you'll want to go four to six inches above um, and make sure that you tie the tourniquet so that you have a one hand release. We want to include the vein not the artery, so you should still be able to feel a pulse below that tourniquet. And don't leave the tourniquet on for more than two minutes. Things to think about when selecting your site, you want to start distally, and it's important to start distally because if we are unable to successfully start that IV, we're going to move up from that site. So you want to be as distal as you um, possibly can be for um, any type of start. We want to, again, avoid that dominant hand if possible. So if they're right-handed, you'll want to um, start the IV on the left side. And if they're left-handed, you'll want to start the IV on the right side. Again, in consideration with whatever medical history that they have. We want to look for straight, large veins. And we want to avoid valves and bifurcations. Um, again, we want to think about with valves, um, we want to make sure that we have started that um, access far enough away that the catheter does not lie within a valve. If it did lie within that valve, the flow could be occluded whenever the valve closes. It's also important that uh, um, to remember that when there is a valve close by, we can actually cause the um, vein to blow if we go through that valve because of the obstruction of the flow of solutions being administered. And then this can result in some um, pain 
for that patient and bruising and things like that. So we want to avoid any um, area with a valve. It's also important to avoid those bifurcations of veins because it can cause backflow issues and even obstruct the flow of the fluids being administered. I always tell people when they're starting IVs, it's not about doing it with your eyes. It truly is about how it feels. One vein might actually look good, but it could be too frail. So you'll get to know your veins and the feel for them. It's definitely something um, that you acquire as a skill. Don't be afraid to try um, because that's, that's part of learning is being able to try and learn on different um, people and textures of skin and, you know, um, the young and the, uh, the elderly and things like that so that you can learn um, all different ways of starting these IVs. Um, a lot of people are afraid to use the bigger 18 and 16 gauges in the beginning. Um, I actually like to um, use the bigger needles. I really can't recall the last time I used anything smaller than an 18 gauge. The needle is firmer and doesn't give as much. We want to also stay away from thick veins right below a bifurcation where the thick veins turn into two small veins like a junction in the road. So those are the types of IVs like we discussed earlier that will blow um, usually within the first hour. Women have the rule of thumb. There's almost always a vein that comes off the thumb where the forearm begins. Look around, you'll see um, I'm right. Any patient, and I mean any patient who has even the slightest chance of being a surgical patient um, for any reason should have a large bore IV 18 gauge or, um, or bigger. So the smaller the number, the, the higher the gauge. The anesthesiologist generally will put in a second larger line if you don't or um, at the time of surgery. Um, anyone receiving an anticoagulant clot blessing, busting therapy like TPA or equivalent should have three lines, one 18 or 16 gauge for blood draws before the med is given. So lots of opportunity there to start IVs. Even if you don't know what you are doing, try and make it seem like you do. Be professional. Don't let your hands shake um, and read your patient. Their eyes can tell you a lot. You also need to listen to your patients. Um, many of them have had experience with IVs in the past, and if they say that I'm a hard stick or stay away from this vein, um, really listen to them because they are giving you clues as to um, you what works best for them and potentially in the success of you starting their IV. Tie the tourniquet tight, but don't forget to take it off. We really want to emphasize that two-minute rule. Um, again, it's about... Um, occluding the vein, we're not occluding the artery, so don't, uh, we should still be able to feel a pulse, but keep that into consideration. Um, again, going back to the bifurcation, those are recognized by an inverted V-shape. These veins are less likely to roll. However, um, you have little chance of a successful IV um, with using those bifurcations. Really access below the bifurcation for the highest chance of success. Accessing large ropey veins often found in the elderly should be done without the use of a tourniquet because the veins are less sound and tend to rupture easily. The use of hand veins in the elderly is not recommended because those also tend to rupture easily. Basilic veins located immediately below the elbow, particularly those in male patients, are large and attractive for venipuncture. However, the accessing is difficult because they tend to roll easily and require significant attempts to stabilize them. So again, they're great for venipuncture, but maybe not necessarily for an IV. Before even attempting to puncture the skin, it is important to immobilize the vein as much as possible so that the peripheral, um, because the peripheral veins have a tendency to roll away from the IV catheter as it approaches them. Two things can be done to address this problem. The first is to, is to pull the skin and with it, the subcutaneous tissues taut prior to introducing the needle. With IV starts in the hand, this is fairly easy to do by flexing the wrist and pulling downwards on the skin, overlying um, um, the MCPs with your non-dominant hand, the one not holding the IV needle. The other thing that can be done 
to make getting the IV needle into the vein easier is to take advantage of bifurcations in the veins themselves. The veins tend to be secured to the underlying tissues at their branch points, so they will tend to roll less. It is important to note, however, that you shouldn't introduce the IV directly again into that bifurcation itself as this causes undue trauma to the vein. Always try to introduce the needle just proximal to the bifurcation. This will also help you avoid those pesky valves. Here are some graphics of um, valves and what we want to avoid when we are starting those IVs. Um, I like the, the picture particularly in the top right, and you can see where those bifurcation and valves are of the vein using the illuminators. And then look at the bottom left with the, the healthy um, venous valves. That's what they're supposed to look like. So you can see why introducing a needle um, and then it, and putting a catheter in those areas can be problematic. Please refer to page 110 in your book about the locations of veins. These are the hand veins, and um, there's digital dorsal, dorsal metacarpal, and the dorsal venous network um, in the, the veins um, for your hands. Um, the digital dorsal, you'll want to use with a small gauge, like a 22 or a 24 gauge only. It needs good support. Um, you can use a tongue blade to help support that so that um, it doesn't move. It's very accessible, but it's not good for large volumes or irritating solutions. The dorsal metacarpal and venous network also need support. They're also very accessible and good because um, most are distal, but can they can easily dislodge and are not good for large volumes or irritating solutions. Don't use for um, CT scan power injections either. Also in the forearm are the basilic vein and the median antebrachial. The basilic is on the ulnar side. It can be difficult to find, but it's also a large vein. It tends to roll and has numerous valves. The median antebrachial uh, can be very difficult to find. Um, there are many nerve endings there and infiltration occurs easily. So we don't try to use that one um, as often. We really need to pay attention to where um, the nerves are and other arteries and veins in proximity of the site that we are selecting. The antecubital space or the antecubital fossa is really um, a preferred area for those short term, you know, we need to get um, IV fluids or medications in quickly in, in times such as like cardiac arrest or trauma. We want to reserve that area, particularly even for blood draws, but it can also be uncomfortable due to the arm extension in the unnatural position and the need to be able to bend that arm. You know, just the slightest bend can affect the flow of the IV fluid. So we tend to avoid this area for any long-term administration. Um, in the antecubital fossa, there's the median cephalic, the median basilic, and the medial cubital veins. I like this cartoon. It says half the work of starting an IV is in selecting the best location. Um, and if you pay attention that they started the IV in the physician or another nurse instead of the actual patient. But um, take the time to really um, select that appropriate location. And that's um, more than half the battle. Remember, the INS standard is the cannula selected shall be the smallest gauge and the shortest length to accommodate the prescribed therapy. And that all catheters should be radiopaque so that if something happens and they get dislodged or things like that, that we'll be able to find them up on x-ray. So for hypertonic solutions, 18 to 20 gauge is a good rule of thumb. For blood, 18 to 20 gauge. And then for pediatric patients, a 22 to 24 gauge are good rules of thumb. Um, in unit three, we reviewed those. So refer back to unit three um, to see that list. The other thing to think about is a peripheral short catheter shall be removed every 96 hours and immediately on suspected contamination, complication, or therapy discontinuation. So that is another INS standard.
um, in choosing the correct gauge, 14 to 16, which is the largest gauges, are um, used for multiple traumas, heart surgery, transplants, and when large amounts of fluid are needed, like in hypovolemic shock and things like that. Um, 18 gauge, major trauma or surgery, blood administration. 20 gauge, minor trauma or surgery, blood administration. 22 gauge, small veins, administration of platelets and plasma, avoid with blood. And then 24 is the smallest, and we would use that mainly in the pediatric set, setting. Um, if we use too large of a gauge, um, the fl we can have phlebitis, th um, thrombi formation, infection, infiltration, and pain. So again, going back to the INS standard, make sure that you're using the appropriate gauge um, for what the need is of that IV site. Further INS standards state that the site selection should routinely um, be initiated in the distal areas of the upper extremities and subsequent cannulation should be made proximal to the previously cannulated site. Avoid using veins at areas of flexion unless the area is immobilized. Veins in the antecubital fossa should be reserved for peripheral, central line, and midline access and for drawing blood samples. You will need to know table 6, 8, and page 326, and that talks about vein dilation. When we talk about gravity, that's positioning the extremity lower than the heart. Um, we can clench and pump the fist. We can stroke the vein downward um, or lightly tap. We want to use a warm compress, and we can use a blood pressure cuff or a tourniquet or a transilluminator. Release the tourniquet until you're ready for the venipuncture once you have located your vein. Some other questions to ponder um, when thinking about site and needle selection is, why is the type of solution ordered relevant in site selection? What should you avoid when choosing a vein? What sites would you avoid for long therapy? What impact does anticoagulation therapy have on site selection and venipuncture? What allergies should you screen for? And why is it important to anticipate CT scans, blood transfusions, or major um, surgeries? Now let's move on to the actual cannulation. We need to pay careful attention to pain management. We need to ensure that we are wearing gloves, that we have prepared our site, including reapplying the tourniquet if needed. Um, we're going to be doing the actual vena puncture and stabilization and the dressing are also part of the cannulation process. Prior to gloving, we want to ensure that we've done appropriate hand hygiene, we've checked for a latex allergy, and that we have our tape ready to go. Site preparation includes potentially hair removal. Again, we're not going to use a razor. We're going to either use scissors or clippers. We don't want to use the razor because it takes off layer of the skin and can cause further irritation and even put the patient at risk for infection. So again, do not use a razor to um, shave hair in the area uh, that you will be starting your IV. In terms of cleansing, there's different ways that we can cleanse. We want to use a vigorous circular motion for 30 seconds and then let dry for 30 seconds. The circular motion, we go from the center and then out with friction. Do not fan or blow the area. We allow it to air dry. With that in mind, Booth says to do alcohol first, then follow with povidone iodine or betadine. Okay, the main thing you need to remember is to go by the agency's policy. Um, they will choose the appropriate um, techniques in terms of cleansing at each site, and that's the policy that you will need to follow. Again, as stated before, um, you use alcohol before betadine, so um, in you don't want to apply the alcohol after because it negates the effect of the povidone iodine. Now, prior to applying the tourniquet, this is the last opportunity you have to apply your gloves and cut your tape if you haven't done so already. We're going to reapply the tourniquet or otherwise descend the vein while waiting for the cleanser to dry. Also make sure the tubing is ready and in reach or the saline lock is ready to go and loosen um, the caps. Make sure gloves are on and tape is cut. Be careful not to contaminate the site that you've already cleaned. 
refer to pages 118 and one through 120 in your book. Um, we're going to anchor the skin below the insertion site and apply traction. Um, you can see with the picture there um, going into that vein, they're providing traction with that left hand while the cannula is in the right hand or the upper hand um, in that picture. We're always going to insert our needle bevel up. And then there are two methods. There's direct or indirect. Direct is good for small needles, fragile hand veins, um, rolling veins, but um, or when there's a risk for hematoma. Indirect can be used for all venipunctures. All right. Again, when providing that traction, make sure you're not pressing too hard because that can compress veins. Also keep in mind that you should have no more than two separate attempts. If you're unsuccessful at that second attempt, then we should be seeking out someone else to try. Again, um, you can use one of the two methods, direct or indirect. We're going to insert at a 30 degree angle while applying traction on the skin to keep it taut. Indirect, we decrease the angle as the cannula enters the vein. We want to note that blood return at that point. So what do you do if there's no blood return? That's an indication that you're not in the vein. That means you will need to restart. Again, no more than two attempts per nurse, and documentation has to happen for those unsuccessful attempts. Once you have that blood return, you're going to lower the angle and advance the needle slightly to assure the catheter has entered the vein. You're going to advance the catheter off the needle using the tab on top of the hub or the wing into the vein until the hub meets the skin. Do not advance the needle any further at this point. You'll then want to engage the stylet into the safety device until it clicks. If you're using an older style needle, you'll retract the needle until just at the entrance of the cannula. Do not remove the stylet completely from the catheter just yet. You'll want to stabilize the catheter at all times until the taping is done, applying gauze under the stylet. Apply pressure above the catheter and then release the tourniquet. Now you'll remove the stylet and connect the IV tubing or the saline lock aseptically. Release the roller clamp to initiate the flow. Observe the flow and the site or flush with the saline if saline lock is attached. The next step is to tape the IV, and you can use either the U, Chevron, or the H taping method. There's also newer stabilization devices, such as the stat lock. Um, it will depend on your facility, what's available to you. Some facilities will have policies on how you tape, but the main thing is to be able to still have visualization of your site. Again, per the INS standards, they need to be stabilized in a manner that does not interfere with assessment and monitoring of the infusion site or impede delivery of prescribed therapy. They should also be used to preserve the integrity of the access device and to prevent catheter migration and loss of access. Catheter stabilization shall be performed using aseptic technique. For the dressing, there are two methods. We can use gauze dressing and secure it with tape, or you can use a transparent semipermeable membrane dressing, which is the preferred method. This slide shows one particular type of transparent semipermeable membrane dressing and the instructions on how to do that. They're all very similar. Um, the different brands will have different manufacturers' um, instructions on how to use. Again, this may be agency-specific. Per the INS standards, if you use gauze, gauze dressings, those should be changed every 48 hours on peripheral sites or when the integrity of the dressing is compromised. Um, the use of non-occlusive type adhesive bandage strip in place of a gauze dressing is non-recommended. TSM dressing should be changed on peripheral short catheters at the time of site rotation or sooner 
if the site gets compromised. We're now going to move on to post cannulation, which includes labeling, equipment disposal, patient education, flow rate calculation, and documentation. The next step is labeling. The INS standard states that distinctive legible labeling shall provide pertinent and easily identified information relative to the cannula dressing solution, medication, and administration set. You're going to label the venipuncture site, the tubing, and the solutions. Additionally, you will create a time strip um, for the fluids, and on the next slide, we'll show an example of that. Keep in mind that labeling will be dependent on your agency's policies, so make sure you're following those and um, the labels that are provided at your agency. This slide is an example of what a time strip could look like. And the reason you'd have this is so that you can have a good visual indicator of um, how much fluid should be administered. So it gives you that, um, that gauge um, from a visual standpoint. Um, in terms of equipment disposal, the stylet must go into the sharps container. Um, the INS standards say that needles and stylets or the sharps shall be disposed of in non-permeable tamper-proof containers. And again, that's per agency um, provided containers, so make sure you know what you have to use. Um, the plastic cannulas, so the part that actually stays in the vein, can go into the glove in the trash up on removal. Education that needs to happen after um, the IV started is any particular limitations on movement and mobility um, of the alarms and the equipment that's going to be used and what those mean. And then we're going to continually monitor the site looking for tenderness, soreness, redness, and swelling. You'll want to make sure you're following your um, facility's policy and how often the site should be monitored and that documentation around that. And then as the nurse, you should be checking that site consistently. Now let's talk about IV infiltration. Um, the patient may give complaints um, in regards to the IV site. Um, for example, in this cartoon, the um, patient saying, nurse, since you hung that medication, my arm really hurts. So now um, an assessment needs to happen. Well, Shirley had an IV containing potassium hung about 15 minutes ago. She can hardly see in the pain, so she notifies her nurse. So we're going to assess that. Um, the IV site, there's no redness or swelling is indicative of a good IV site. If there is redness and swelling at that site, it is probably an indicator that we need um, to, to do something because there is an IV infiltration happening. Depending on the IV solution, permanent damage may be done to the soft tissue around the site. Immediate intervention should be done to examine the site and stop the fluids if necessary. Flushing the site with normal saline to minimize damage is helpful and less painful. Notifying the doctor and getting an order for site care and a change in IV administration is also necessary. So in this one, the patient is stating that the, um, her arm is red and sore around the IV dressing. Um, what we don't want to do is wait to assess it. We need to assess it immediately because if it is an infiltration, we need to address it as quickly as possible. So don't ignore that. When a patient requires continued care in his or her home, the nurse shall provide comprehensive education to the patient and caregiver. That includes the behavioral domains of cognitive, affective, and psychomotor, along with a written set of instructions on all pertinent aspects of treatment. And that is required by the INS. When setting the flow rate, we need to verify with the MAR and the physician's orders. We need to look at the rate solution duration and double check any dosage calculations. Um, you're going to set gravity flow or the controller and all IV infusions should be monitored frequently for accurate flow rates and complications associated with infusion therapy. When we're talking about the flow rate, there are several factors that will affect the flow rate and that includes the patient's body surface area, the patient's condition, the age, the tolerance, and any changes in blood pressure. Poorly regulated infusions can lead to fluid overload, overdosing, or underdosing of medication, clogged IV catheters, phlebitis, and even infiltration. Factors that may um, play a role in flow rate control could be patient-related, equipment-related, or vein-related. 
Slower rates such as keep vein open or KVO may be difficult to maintain if the patient has a high blood pressure. Gravity drip may not be able to overcome high blood pressure, so you may need a pump. Other factors affecting the flow rates include the height of the container, occlusion of tubing or lumen, faulty regulator clamps or tampering, cold fluid, the composition of fluid, change in cannula position, trauma to vein, and a clogged air vent. Keep in mind that thicker fluids run slower and warm solutions drip faster than cold ones. Post-procedure will have monitoring, um, which needs to be done immediately after the procedure as well as ongoing. We're going to be um, assessing the cannula, the exit site, the surrounding area, the flow rate, clinical data, patient response, and compliance. You know, every time you enter the room and on a regular schedule basis, you should be assessing that IV site. Look at the site and the fluid. Feel the site for warmth and check for wetness. Documentation should include the procedure, including any unsuccessful attempts. Any unexpected outcomes such as tenderness, swelling, draining, and actions taken should be documented. And we also need to document patient education and response and effectiveness of the teaching. The INS standard around documentation states that documentation in the patient's medical records should contain sufficient information to identify infusion procedures, prescribed treatments, complications, nursing interventions, and patient outcomes. In regards to certain populations, there are some special considerations that you need to keep in mind. For the geriatric, we want to avoid the back of the hand because it lacks skin turgor and has limited subcutaneous tissue, therefore making it hard to stabilize. And veins are weaker and more prone to infiltration. We may not need a tourniquet, um, because it can cause too much pressure when we are working with vein distension. Prone, they're prone to fluid overload related to reduced kidney function or chronic disease, so watch for that fluid overload. And then be considerate of tape because their skin integrity um, is worse as you get older, so um, they can their skin can tear easily. With the obese, you may need to use warm compresses so that those veins can dilate and be easier to access. Definitely use your anatomical landmarks. Um, sometimes it's difficult um, because of the, the adipose there. So just um, take your time. And then you may need multiple tourniquets depending on their habitus. Um, you want to hold firm pressure for a minute and then look for vein in that depressed area. That may be helpful. Additionally, keep in mind these 13 um, tips for IV um, therapy. Number one, take your time when choosing the right vein. Remember earlier I stated being prepared is more than half the battle. Two, take your time performing the venipuncture. Three, think about the purpose, the appropriate access, the appropriate catheter size, and the appropriate site for what you're doing with this IV. Number four, apply the tourniquet um, six to eight inches above the selected puncture site. Number five, no veins. Let the arm hang down for a while in the praying position for puncture. This allows gravity to help you a little bit. Again, number six, if there's no veins, apply warm towels or washcloths over the area for several minutes. Number seven, if there's bad filling, milk the vein Gently stroke from distal to proximal. Number eight, if there are no veins, use double tourniquets, one high on the arm and one four inches from the puncture site. Number nine, for low blood pressure, use a blood pressure cuff, not a tourniquet. Number 10, for well-filled but fragile veins, try puncturing without using a tourniquet. Number 11, patients with hypovolemia, we want to use large veins as small veins collapse quicker. Number 12, when a patient is grossly edematous, apply a tourniquet for a few minutes to create an indentation. After removal, a vein can usually be seen in the well of the indentation. And number 13, apply warm towels on the cannulated arm if an irritating medicine is being infused. This concludes Module 5, Part B. Thank you.